Was Holmes and Yo-Yo's one of the worst television shows of all times? Or was it just ahead of its time? Maybe you're asking yourself, what is Holmes and Yo-Yo? Sounds like a new toy from Kenner. Join me, that junk man, as we look back at the pre-Robocop 1976 TV sitcom, Holmes and Yo-Yo. <laughs> the junk room everybody it's me that junk man coming back at you to talk pop culture what are we going to talk about today well we're going to talk about the 1976 abc classic classic homes and yo-yo i'm not even sure out there who remembers this show but growing up as a kid i actually like this show it's been ranked on tv guide at number 33 as one of the worst television shows ever but me personally as a kid in 1976-1977, I enjoyed this. But then again, I was only about five years old. So I decided to go back to episode one, the pilot episode, and rewatch Holmes and Yo-Yo. Because I haven't seen it since way back in the late 70s. But before we get into that, as always, if you want to support this channel, head over to Patreon.com. Links in the description below or go over to ThatJunkMan.com where you can get some cool shirts and that. Buy some cool t-shirts. We got some new Junkman merchandise shirts. And Star Wars shirts, Kenner shirts, toy shirts, old retail store shirts, and more. But let's get on to it. Let's talk Holmes and Yo-Yo. The story of Holmes and Yo-Yo revolves around two detectives. One, a down-on-his-luck detective named Alex Holmes, played by Richard Sewell, who has a pre-Ace Ventura-style haircut, and his new partner, Gregory Yo-Yo. Now, Yo-Yo is short for a longer name that I can't pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. We call him Yo-Yo after his creator, uh, Gregory Yoyonovich. He is played by John Shruck. I kind of see him as the poor man's Elliot Gould. I personally know this guy more from the Star Trek movies where he played a Klingon in at least two of the old Star Trek movies. Yo-Yo is a young, naive, but good-natured new detective. And he has a secret that only a few know about. Yo-Yo is an android. No, not that kind of android. This kind of android. Holmes himself doesn't even know in the first episode that his new partner is a robot. The show ran for 13 episodes, one full season. And let's take a look at the very first episode that premiered in late 1976. The show opens with a very cheesy 70s intro, showing the two stars mugging for the camera. And believe it or not, this opening was the only thing that made me laugh hard. The opening scene shows our heroes racing from scene to scene, jumping from the car. After the first few times, it hits you. These scenes were done over and over again every time Holmes leaves his car door open. To me, this felt like something from Naked Gun, and it made me laugh. And at the very end, it's revealed they're running to the bathroom. The show opens with Holmes and his current partner, Mahoney, relaxing in their parked car. I guess just waiting for a call when they are rear-ended. Oddly, Mahoney's first reaction is to draw his gun, like he is about to open fire. This is not really played for laughs. Once out of the car to investigate, Holmes learns that the driver is a student driver, and that sends the laugh track erupting with laughter. the proper way to park a car. This isn't it. I, for the life of me, can't figure out what the joke is here. Is it because she's a student driver? It's like they put in a laugh track just for the fun of putting in a laugh track. As the driver and Holmes talk, the laugh track continues. It keeps going like we're watching a fine-tuned comedy routine. Yet, on the screen, nothing funny is happening. The two detectives are called to check out a report of a prowler at a local home. 
Why two plainclothes detectives were called to check out a prowler? I'm not really sure. It seems like they would have some kind of beat cops for that. Once there, Holmes mistakenly opens the garage door. In doing so, we see one of the weirdest garage door opening mishaps ever as a thief bolts out with his stolen car. With Holmes' partner now injured, Holmes is given a new partner to help find the rare antique car. That partner is Yo-Yo, a new field test experience who is a 427 mobile computer. He's a completely mobile computer. He has a photographic memory, a real photographic memory. Press his nose and a Polaroid photo comes out of his shirt pocket. Room outside. Who's that man wearing the typewriter? It's gotta be Holmes. Yo-Yo is teamed up with Holmes, who doesn't know Yo-Yo is an android. Despite his odd behavior and his tick of often repeating phrases over and over and over and over. Yes, sir. Where you been working, Yo-Yo? 23rd Precinct. Yeah, what division? The Bunko Squad. How long you been with them? The Bunko Squad. Yeah, how long you been with them? The Bunko Squad. <laughs> Three years, four years with the precinct. <laughs> the new partners head back to the scene of the crime where Holmes tries to interview the car owner, Mr. Powers, who is upset at the timing of this as he's trying to watch two football games. His uncaring about his lost car really spoils the twist at the end of this show. When trying to conduct an interview, Mr. Powers can't stop using his remote to switch between the two football games. The remote somehow also causes Yo-Yo to turn and look at the TV with each click. This remote also seems to have the power of making the laugh track go off with each click. The joke here might be funny if done once or twice, but the joke goes on and on and on. What starts off as being a little funny just becomes very annoying very fast. The two move outside the real scene of the crime, the garage. However, to enter it, Holmes must use the garage remote to open the door. Being that we already seen a remote control joke being overused less than 60 seconds before, you know it's gonna happen here also. Holmes presses the button on the remote, sending Yo-Yo spinning around like a broken garage door. Also, again, the remote control has an effect on the laugh track as it goes crazy again with laughter. Yo-Yo explains he was just doing his daily exercises. I'll give you this scene. Yo-Yo flipping around? It is a little funny, but I think it's mostly due to the odd effect of the stuntman on wires. The two quickly find a magnet that was used to open the garage from the inside. And this is the thief's calling card. As Yo-Yo explains to Holmes how the thief got away, we are given one of the most longest, awkward pauses in television history. Kincaid must have driven it right into the truck. Yeah, I know that. The two detectives just happened to drive right past Kincaid, the car thief. Sure looks like it. They also happen to drive right into the back of a semi truck's trailer. The two bicker back and forth using clearly a DR that doesn't even sound like they're in a police car, much less like they're in a trailer. Alex, you drove into a truck. Just testing our theory. Well, you'd better back the car up. I know that. However, before they exit the trailer, they are unaware that it has moved forward causing the two fall to the hard concrete below. We better get going before Kincaid gets away. Pleasure, Doc. The two then search the content of shipping boxes without a warrant, without even getting permission from the company's owner. All it takes for the worker to open the crate is for Yo-Yo to ask him, 
over and over and over and over and over and over again. I don't know. What's in the box? I don't know. What's in the box? I just work here. What's in the box? Okay, get off my back. What's in the box? Automobile box. What's in the box? I just told you. What's in the book? In it? <laughs> However, the two find more than just stolen car parts. They find the body of Kincaid who just a few minutes before was just standing on the side of the road talking to a friend. Isn't that Kincaid? Where? Over there. Look. Sure looks like it. Now, somehow he's dead. Not just dead, but he's boxed up with car parts. All within a few minutes. Then, the two do what most detectives do after they find the dead body of their wanted thief. They head to the local diner. You want half of my sandwich? Thanks. Why don't you try some of my blue plate? Thanks. At the diner, Yo-Yo takes a bite of his plate. Yes, a bite of his plate. As they remember about a manual at Mr. Powers' home about how to take a car apart. The two detectives theorize that Mr. Powers, or maybe his wife, stole the car themselves for insurance money. The two head over to Mr. Powers' house. Once there, Yo-Yo uses his robot powers, I guess, I'm not really sure. He seems to find out that Kincaid's fingerprints are on the manual. Yo-Yo has the proof he needs, stating that Powers gave the manual to Kincaid, who used the manual to take the car apart to ship it. Then, Powers killed Kincaid and took his manual back. Kincaid? I don't know any Kincaid. This book proves that you and Carl Kincaid were working together. You gave Kincaid the book so that he could take the car apart. Then after you'd killed him, you took the book back so that you could put the car together. I don't know what you're talking about. However, earlier when they interviewed Powers, the manual was already at Powers' house. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to check out this book. Assembly and Maintenance of Your Graham Beanie. Then we see Kincaid at the loading center without a book in his hand. Isn't that Kincaid? Where? Over there. Look. And minutes later, he's killed and stuffed into a shipping box. There's something I don't like. We also found the driver. Kincaid. This makes absolutely no sense at all. But in bad guy TV fashion, what does Mr. Powers do? Does he play dumb? Of course not. He pulls out a gun and makes a run for it. Stay where you are. The two head off in Powers' new unfinished kit car that Yo-Yo explains is the fastest car ever made. It goes 0 to 150 in 10 seconds. The two head after Powers, and due to the speed of the world's fastest car, they blow right past the wanted car. That for some reason now has a long piece of yellow wood hanging on the side. I don't understand where this piece of wood came from or how it got there. My guess is from a yellow wooden caution sign that the car will hit later. As Powers almost gets away, wait, hold on a second. What is that concerned citizen doing back there? Out of nowhere, another car forces Mr. Powers up the side of a truck ramp. Who is the unlikely hero? It's the student driver from the beginning of the show. But it seems during the crash, Yo-Yo was thrown from his car and is lying motionless on the road. Could Yo-Yo be dead? Killed in the very first episode? Of course not. To help Yo-Yo get air, Holmes unties Yo-Yo's tie. Not knowing that this is how you access Yo-Yo's control center. The door on his chest plate flies open, revealing to Holmes that Yo-Yo is an android. And how does the shock Holmes react to finding out his new partner and friend is a machine? This is how. You're a... You're not a person. And then we get one of the most corniest dialogues from TV. And we're both programmed, Alex. Each in our own way. 
Well, I'm sorry I malfunctioned, but I thought it was human to fail. Holmes quickly discovers that Yo-Yo is bleeding. Wait, no, he's leaking. Leaking oil. oil. He looks up for help and sees a car repair shop just across the street. He runs over quickly to tell Jay Leno that he needs two cans of oil, the best brand he has. Seeing this brings a tear to Yo-Yo's eye. His new partner is more than just a partner, he's a new friend. Back at the office, the two finish up their reports. Holmes hard at work typing out his report as Yo-Yo sits back with his typewriter plugged into the outlet on his chest as the report types itself. Holmes unplugs the typewriter and explains that he will keep Yo-Yo's secret and the two head off to have a nice cold soda from the nearby vending machine. That is until it takes Holmes' quarter. But don't worry, Yo-Yo is there to plug the vending machine into his outlet, releasing not only cans and cans and cans of off-brand soda, but also weeks worth of coins, like a loose slot machine in Las Vegas. The two and the laugh track machine share a laugh as the show fades to the closing credits. There you learn the main villain, Mr. Powers, was played by character actor Alan Miller. However, this credit on Holmes and Yo-Yo is mysteriously left off of his IMDB page. What are you trying to hide, Mr. Miller? Are you ashamed of your work on Holmes and Yo-Yos? This show was considered one of the worst television shows ever. But is it really that bad? Yes and no. I've seen a lot worse, that's for sure. First off, re-watching this show, I think the first 10 minutes or so did work. Sure, it was stupid and corny in that 70s TV way, but that's not always a bad thing. The jokes might not have worked in today's television market, but for 1976, I can kind of see how it worked. At least some of the jokes at the beginning. However, after the first 10 minutes, it really starts to fall off the rails, and they use the same joke over and over again, where it just takes away from the humor. But this is a pilot episode, and it's hard to judge a TV show on a pilot episode. Because let's face it, most first episodes, not that really good. The writers, the actors are still trying to learn the characters. So this show might could have grown into something given more than just one season. Starting to watch this episode after reading about how bad it was, I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was. Again, I've seen a lot of worse television shows that gets a lot more than one season. So it's not the worst thing on television by far. I think if they aimed it for a much younger market, and I mean a much younger market, like preteens, that it might would have succeeded. If this came on on the afternoons on a Saturday, I think I would have watched it at least until I was about 11 or 12. I liked the concept and it was new at the time. And most of these episodes were before Star Wars when everyone, especially kids, went science fiction crazy. If this show came out after Star Wars, I think a lot of kids would tune in just to see a robot. Like we all watched Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers, not because it was good, because it reminded us of Star Wars. Well, this has been That Junkman with a classic TV review. I hope you enjoy this, or so we'll do more. You might have noticed some changes on the YouTube page, such as Star Wars Junk is now gone, and we're just calling this page That Junkman. Don't worry, we're still going to talk about Star Wars a lot. And we're still going to talk Kenner, toys, the 80s, pop culture. But I just wanted to free myself to where people coming to my channel wouldn't expect just Star Wars stuff. You that's been subscribed to this channel already know I talk about a lot of stuff that's not just Star Wars. I worry that people will see the title Star Wars Junk and kind of not click on it thinking, hey, here's just another guy that talks Star Wars. So even if you see a name change, an icon change, and all that, don't worry, this channel is going to be basically the same. I know you probably clicked on this and said, oh no, that junk man, look, he's turned that Star Wars junk. Look, he turned Star Wars junk into a Holmes and Yo's channel. I'm not going to review every episode, just this episode. So don't worry, yes, the name has changed, but we're still the same junk, and I hope we're going to get better. So don't worry, Star Wars junk is still here, we're just calling it that junk man. The content that you all came here because you love will continue. I want to thank you for watching and always subscribe to this channel and check out some of the other videos if you hadn't, such as this one right here. That's a really good video. Or this one. I think you'll really enjoy that one also. And if you have Twitter, follow us at the new Twitter account, That Junk Man. 
Link will be in the description below. And as always, support this channel. Head over to Patreon.com or ThatJunkMan.com to support this channel. Thank you very much. We'll be back very soon. And thank you, sir, for that unsolicited testimony.